welcome. Uh, my name is Mindy Johnson, and uh, hopefully we're getting everybody in and underway, and I hope you guys are ready for a terrific start to uh, what I hope will be an, an engaging and dynamic forum for you to uh, expand on your own work, your own creativity, so feel free. I believe uh, there is a chat feature there. We'll be monitoring that, so feel free to jump in and participate. Um, this is our first, so bear with us if we get a little off track, but I'm um, looking forward to a great uh, spending some time with you and a great opportunity to learn and uh, expand your world a little bit through part of what I've been doing. And to get underway while we're waiting for a few more folks to make their way in, I wanted to get us started with a particular approach. Our topic today is um, a look at finding the funny. And if we uh, recognize through our world that uh, it is a balance daily between comedy and tragedy. Uh, we've known this from the very beginning of civilization. And uh, we find that when we look at what is funny, it's a pretty simple explanation of that, the causing of laughter or amusement, humorous. And the industry that the arts, part of what the arts uh, provide is a source of funny, and particularly in the industry we're gonna be looking at today of animation. Uh, but we've got a lot of other different elements about what is funny, and when we think about it, it's an intrinsic part of who we are as humans. Even from the very beginning, there's a natural inclination to appreciate and experience and express humor and what is funny. I mean, come on, you can't resist, right? Every little one has adorable faces that are expressive. And we can, regardless of who we are and what we're experiencing, we can look on that and find the funny in, in these expressions, even from the very beginning. Um, these extremes also, <laughs> how we express. Uh, who doesn't love a good boo-boo lip, right? <laughs> and it's something, kind of uniform between all of us as humans. We, we have that ability to express and to react and to experience what is funny uh, and, and share our opinions on it or not. <laughs> so um, it's part of what makes us human. And when we look at applying this towards comedy, which is getting to the industry that we're gonna be talking about today, and applying this, it really is professional and entertainment, jokes and satirical sketches, to make an audience laugh, to achieve that form of finding humor. And we look at what are the greats of humor, of comedy, from the very beginning in our visual medium here of cinema. Uh, Chaplin had a very interesting and very poignant take on this. Uh, again, getting back to that um, combination of the, the dramatic masks of life, comedy, and tragedy. And we keep comedy in the long shot, according to Chaplin. But it's this type of approach to comedy that was a key part of our early cinematic history. Uh, silent era is uh, sort of the, the, uh, the well of all things, the establishment of great physical comedy. And that's the basis for a lot of our humor. Chaplin, Keaton, of course, Harry Langdon, and the great Harold Lloyd, each of these masters of physical comedy rose to prominence through the silent era in a visual form. And let us not forget the ladies of comedy as well. There were many, uh, Mabel Norman on the left, Marie Dressler, Edna Provence, and of course, the great Mary Pickford in silent film. Um, so we wanna keep the ladies represented as well. And moving into sound, uh, many transitioned from silent into sound, the, the uh, Laurel and Hardy. And we also get the physicality still continues through, adding with uh, sort of other approaches to humor, certainly through the Marx Brothers, who were masters at both the physical comedy and the spoken comedy. Uh, many great Groucho Marx references along the way. Uh, we still see today in, in comedy. And of course, the great physicality of the Three Stooges. And, of, 
And as we move into the early days of television, there were many women. It's, it's not, comedy is not restricted solely to the men. We have many great uh, women comedians as well, beyond Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett, Phyllis Diller, um, uh, Joan Rivers, uh, just so many others that we can look at through the pantheon of, of our approach to, his, to history and humor. And as we look at humor, being amused, this experience of comedy, the experience of laughter, and the idea of expressing it through humor, full of humor, um, it was Aristotle who sort of encapsulated, going back to the very beginning, where the secret of humor is. And that really is the element of surprise. <laughs> uh, and that sort of explains the genesis of many of our great comedians, um, is that element of surprise and extreme and uh, unexpected. So when we tie this to animation, we bring it to uh, Blackton's, uh, J. Stuart Blackton's humorous faces, faces or funny faces. He saw right away what humor could be applied, how entertaining and engaging this new form of animation could be. And taking something as simple as uh, simply transitioning those images to express a humorous situation or to amuse us through uh, movement. Uh, and really, it turns out to be nothing more than the illusion of that um, chalk on a chalkboard. But the idea of moving from image to image and finding humor and indeed the unexpected of Windsor McKay's Gertie finding a dinosaur being tame and, and being able to perform tricks so early animation tapped into humor it was crucial to this form and as we evolve through the history of animation it brings us to uh, we see different types of humors through the forms of character uh, through the forms of the physicality of what they're doing through the forms of the situation the character is in. And these are all elements we're gonna be talking about today as we move to uh, our guest and his role in contemporary animation. Uh, Jordan Koch has uh, been a remarkable presence in animation for the last number of years, uh, working on some of these top series and programs, including the 7D, Loud House, Casa Grandes, and now more recently on the renewed Tom and Jerry show. And the element of physicality and situation and timing are all key into what he does. So without further ado and getting underway, we are gonna spend, we have the great opportunity here to spend some time and get inside the mind and magic of Jordan Koch. So Jordan, this is your cue hey, <laughs> on your camera and welcome. Am I here, can you see me? I'm going to stop sharing your your card, and we're going to see you. There you are. That, that introduction was kind of like perusing like four core, like four star restaurants around town, and then deciding you're just going to go for a hamburger anyway. To to be the to be the end of a line of Carol Burnett's and Lucy and Chaplin is incredible. <laughs> you need a good hamburger now and then, right? It's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you certainly are set within that pantheon. So here <laughs> we are. it's welcome and thanks for joining. And thank you for having me. Inviting us into your your world there. Uh, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting into your work and this idea of finding the funny in what you do. Uh, briefly explain as a storyboard artist, kind of that's that's pretty key to what um, your role is. Taking yeah. a, a script which might be pretty generic, pretty, you know, character enters a room. How do you find a way to make that funny? How do you plus that up? That's the, hard, that's the hardest part to explain to people and, uh, and try and relay and, you know, even educate. You know, I, I still have family members that know what the shows that I've worked on are, and they put two and two together, and they've certainly heard of Nickelodeon and Disney and, Tom and Jerry and things like that. And yet, after five plus years, they still don't exactly know what I do as a storyboard artist physically day to day when I close the door and I sit down and actually do the work. And I've explained, you know, but it's just, 
it's not the same as because you're kind of behind the curtain you're behind the Cintiq you're behind the panels you know um but you nailed it that's exactly what it is you know we're uh usually in animation there's especially tv a lot of this point of view is going to be coming from that today um there's board driven shows and then there's script driven shows um you know with the loud house was uh, a script driven show so we had full scripts that were written you know we had a they were 11 minute cartoons and um you know the scripts were 16 15 16 pages and it was dialogue it was they do this they do that you know um sort of from the very beginning of the show the writing staff was uh was told to write 95 percent finished scripts um and i remember hearing that there were some writers that didn't eventually get the job because they were like no no we write we write scripts beginning middle end 100 percent. they were like no no 90 to 95 because we have a whole board team that's going to come in and fill in the rest and there were some writers that didn't couldn't understand and they subsequently thankfully didn't get hired you know and so we had our the the scripts for the loud house were thorough and they were written out but they were definitely there was room you know it was it was not written that a character you know flings open their door slides into the hallway with the door being pulled from their, you know, motion behind them as they bounce down each step two at a time. That, no, it was character leaves the room, runs down the steps and outside, you know. But then it was up to us to say, you know, a lot of times because these were only 11 minute shows, it would be easier to have them slide down the banister instead of run down each step, you know, because it's less frames and things like that. So a lot of that interpretation, um, also piggybacks on economics in terms of time and money and things like that so um but when it comes down to it it's it's your interpretation of the material tom and jerry was board driven so they would give you a premise which um leaves much more interpretation and, and room for for us to to dive into it like that um but that's really what it comes down to the the most successful way i've found to explain to people is i'm given words and i need but what you see on TV are pictures, you know? And so somehow they have to go from being what could be a radio play, a stage play, a movie, a TV. It goes from that to being, you know, and often we do poses, expressions, things that, you know, if you're doing your job right, or if the show allows you to, things that you can't do with, you know, George Clooney or, or live actors. So, um, so that that's that bridge. That bridge is take the words, turn them into pictures, and in addition to that, make you know it's like taking a recipe. You don't feed, you don't put recipe cards on people's plates when they come over, right? You turn that recipe into something. You adjust the seasoning. You maybe put you know maybe it's a little spicier than it was originally intended, but and then you serve them something that came from this structure, this foundation. Well put. I think that places it in a good context. So when you, um, to get you to a point to be feeling comfortable in doing this, what kinds of things have influenced you? Where have you, I mean, obviously you're drawing on a big bag of tricks, right? From things you experienced as a kid, life experiences, um, you place yourself in the mindset uh, are you looking for references? Are there idiosyncrasies that you need to integrate with characters? Talk yeah, about it's all what you've exposed yourself to, what you've been shown, you know? I owe a lot of that to my parents, my grandparents, things that I was introduced to. Um, you know, kid just doesn't, you know, go from playing with blocks and then learning their, you know, spelling and numbers and then all of a sudden discovers Johnny Carson. You know, somebody has to, you know, show you these sorts of things, you know, and so there's a responsibility for, you know, people, you know, us moving forward, folks that came before us and things. Um, but it all comes back to what do you, what do you look at? What do you read? You know, any, any, you know, 60 minutes interview with some, you know, high prolific, you know, figure will be asked, you know, what are you reading right now? You know, well, I'm, you know, I have a book right now about the origins of Seinfeld, you know, and, how do you, what do you do day to day when you're making a show that's ultimately about nothing, you know? And it's very fascinating to me, you know? And, um, and so for me, it was the, the things that I'm taking in, the things that I was looking at, you know, you can ask anybody that I went to college with. Um, I, I mean, it's not the, it's not what art teachers or, you know, peers or contemporaries really 
expect or maybe even want to hear, but I didn't enjoy art history as much as other people, you know, because it was a lot of stuff in the past. It was a lot of stuff in the past. And, you know, you recognize those names, you know, but for an entire semester, it's a lot of dates and a lot of paintings and heavy books that were expensive and things like that, where clips of, you know, Jackie Gleason and Lucy and Carol Burnett on YouTube were free, you know? So I would go home after, you know, back to my, my dorm in college and I would watch those clips with my roommates. We would find bits, we would find gags, you know, you know, Charlie Chaplin's bit of, you know, where he's at the barber shop and his timing. And then you learn that Chuck Jones borrowed all of that Chaplin stuff for most of his cartoons, especially the coyote and thing, you know, characters that didn't talk, borrowed those all from Chaplin's pantomime. And then you start to see, oh no, I'm not just avoiding art history and exams because the, there is, you know, brilliance and there is a reason to do this, you know, so it's a lot of that stuff. It's a lot of, you know, what do you enjoy? Why do you enjoy it? You know. And, you know, there's the phrase that animators are artists, actors with pencils. Um, and certainly in Storyboard, too, it's, it's kind of bringing all of your background, your skills. So you bring a unique voice to what you do. Are you, do you feel that you get cast in certain things, people look to your strengths, and, and is that something you're working to cultivate in, in what you do? I think so. I mean, one thing that's important with the industry now is, um, is artists will almost always be asked to do a test. Um, and there's a lot of dispute whether that's needed, you know, what, you know, is it a waste of time? Is it a waste of thing? I said, nobody questions why an actor has to audition. It's because, you know, I, we didn't think that, you know, I remember when they, hearing stories about when they were casting Everybody Loves Raymond. And the, you know, Ray and the crew, you know, the, the team developing that show had in mind a shorter brother for Raymond because of that pairing. Um, the brother character always felt in the shadow of his other brother, Raymond, and things like that. So they were, and Ray's original, his real life brother is shorter than him. That was what they all went into this. And then Brad Garrett, six eight, walks through the door, and his take on the character was to a very, very deep voice. And he read the same material that was written, you know, with their preconceived notion. And all of a sudden, the entire team looked at each other and said, "This is funnier. That he's bigger. His voice is deeper. He and you basically took Eeyore and made him six eight. And here's this guy who is taller, has to duck to get in the door, and he's still not, he's still not reaching what his other favored brother is. Achieving. You know, it's brilliant. It's just brilliant like that, you know? So that's in turn, a lot of, a lot of what the art tests are, you know, is are you a good fit for this show, you know? And then once you're on the show, you know, the early days of The Loud House, um, a lot of the scripts would be reordered to be given to certain board artists, you know? Um, there were some board artists early on that were really good with cinematic, you know, high, huge sequences, big episodes, things like that. Um, I favored more along the side of staging composition. You know, we had 11 main characters. How do you fit them all in a scene? You know, I think at the beginning of season three, I did like four episodes in a row that had like, you know, first line of the episode for, you know, page one was like the siblings all gather, you know, uh, in one room and you're like, God, you know? And so it's who's sitting on the floor, who's sitting on the bed, where's the baby? Is somebody holding her? You know, and it's like, and it became, you know, there was a lot of choreography involved, you know? And so, yeah, it, there is, you know, certainly casting involved, you know, to some degrees. Well, I want to take a look. I know we've got some examples of your work and we're going to also get an opportunity to have you do some stuff for us cool. too. So, um, <laughs> While you're repositioning there and getting sustenance along the way, um, let's let's move to an example here. Hope we've got your camera up and running. And let's uh, I'm going to throw the gauntlet down at you and, and give you a little little uh, concept. So, say for example, um, uh, Little Red Riding Hood is about to enter uh, the the wolf's home. Um, what kind of a, a setting, uh, or uh, let's talk about world a little bit. Um, I know we've got some examples of 
of uh, Matt, if we can switch to the setting of the worlds that uh, Jordan has supplied. Um, some of talk a little bit about first of all what kind of a construct you want to place your characters in to expand the funny out of it. Sure, I mean it's all just what material are you given and what have you you know what what's there what you know does something exist already you know a lot of times in TV we try to reuse as much as possible so that every single background you see isn't freshly drawn because that's just impossible in terms of production you know and multiple seasons and uh you know i was on the ladders for five years you know believe it or not we reused hallways and you know bedrooms and things like that so it, you have to you know so um you know so in this instance um you know it's it's what what are we doing what's the audience who is this for you know is is this for, you know, the preschool audience? I've done a lot of work for, for Nickelodeon's development department for, for Nick Jr. You know, that's different than, you know, the folks down the block who are working on Rick and Morty, you know, which, you know, airs 1130 at night, you know, and, and things like that, you know. So um, it's really important to keep that in mind, you know, and a lot of times it's, there's so much that you have to, you know, sort of take in and, and understand that it can just seem like it's all about, uh learning to draw well do i is my portfolio strong enough am i posting enough online and it's like there's there's more details as you get you know involved with it. you know so if i get a phone call from the folks uh from the from nick jr you know and hey we want you to you know give us your take on this i know who that's going for i don't play down at all but you just it's a different approach you know and i go back to to, to dinner you know if, if you're hosting a a picnic or a party in your backyard and you've got a dozen four-year-olds coming over, you know, it's like chicken cordon bleu is probably not going to go over super well. You know, meanwhile, if we have a dinner party, you know, and you come over and we invite some other, other peers, you know, and they come over and I roll out a bunch of grilled cheese sandwiches, it's like, you know, it might not also be, you know, so it, you really have to play to the strengths and to, and to where that's going, you know, so right. um, uh, do we want to share that slide or do you want me to go back over here? Yeah. Let's, now let's take a look at that if we can. Um, we've got a, a, you sent some examples on some of the different worlds and how humor can be applied uh, in establishing the worlds of, of certain characters. Yeah, for sure. These are all examples of uh, backgrounds and locations that did not previously exist um, when I was asked to board them. You know, bottom right, you know, I kids you know ended up on a playground well that was i think that was from my actually first episode so that was episode 28 we didn't have a playground you know so uh you know you can call me a board artist you can call me an artist you can call me whatever but for a brief amount of time i was asked to design a playground and that involves google searches and all kinds of stuff in order to figure out well what do i want to do with this what do i want it to look like and then you start to you know infuse yourself where it's like well rock wall would be kind of fun visually what would this look like you know the different angles of the slides and you know areas for the kids to interact and things like that um you know so you know the 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 pole the fireman's pole leading from you know the top level to the to the bottom level and you know, it was just building that stage for your characters to play on you know same things um with all the other ones really you know it, it became uh you know bottom left that construction site uh you know the character lincoln he was chasing that that book which just as lincoln runs in that book gets lifted up in the air on that i-beam um you know that when you're setting that stage for that action you're not going to put anything other than that i-beam right in the middle there because very important for that book to be highlighted you know that's why you know i add a little bit of color to it so that makes sure that we really understand um you know and then certainly with the foreground the background other elements um you know you can see where things you know just to help populate the scene um you know and if anybody who can look at it from the same lens probably has a good idea that once lincoln misses that book he's going to run to that elevator in the back in order to go up to the same height um that was one of my favorite things as a kid you know the old scooby-doo episodes and um you know you're like wow why is that door so much brighter than the rest of the background and just as you're processing that thought that door swings open 
And then years later, you realize, oh, it's because that door wasn't part of the background. That was a separate cell and things like that. But nonetheless, you go back and look, that door is in a great position. You know, it's rule of thirds. It really adds well to the composition. It's not tucked away in the background or anything. It's there as a part of the set for your characters to interact with. And that's animation, that's theatrical, that's stage, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, I love, I love those examples of set design and, and borrowing from, you know, the same sorts of things. Matt, if you want to go to the other set design slide. I'm gonna pull that one up. Yeah, so here are a couple examples of, um, you know, theatrical sets, you know, and uh, I didn't have a great art program in high school, so I did a lot of theater in high school, plays and musicals, and um, also, you know, something that I hold very close in regards to, you know, the stuff that I pull from on a day-to-day. -day. Um, you can see in all of these examples, staircases leading to doorways, doorways that just go off into a dark hallway, things like that. There's so much energy in these, and I get so inspired by looking at images like this because we're looking at playgrounds. You know, you may have people in Victorian era clothing and, you know, maybe different, more often than not, different time, different locations, different, you know, decades and things like that, um, time periods. But nonetheless, it's still a playground. You know, you've got seats, you've got ashtrays, you've got staircases, you know, look at these sets. Why would they build a staircase to a second level if a character's not going to interact or come from that second level? Everything in a theatrical set design is deliberate. It's all there to serve the show. And those, every one of those principles has to be uh, taken over into, into animation. You know, there, like I said, there's some things um, to help populate the scenery, but you, know, you can't just start with a, a blank storyboard panel and just start making your characters act and, and deliver the dialogue. You have to give them a space for them to, for them to play in, for them to perform the scene, you know? So applying this to, let's go to your drawing board then at that point. Let's uh, take a look at how we build a world uh, for our scene of Little Red Riding Hood. Obviously it takes place in the woods. We know that element of the story. Um, so what kind of, how would you plus this to a more humorous take on it? Um, well, where do you want to, um... So we've got um, a little red riding hood entering the entering the coming to the the wolf's house in the forest right. and coming in. Well, you know, it's I tell people this all the time. I don't draw these lines in, but um, you know, it's like, well, I tend to favor like this area here, you know. So if, if this is the moment when, you know, little red riding hood's coming out of the the woods, uh, you know, she's seeing this for the first time. And here's the thing, I, I hate every first drawing that I do. I hate everything about what I'm doing right now. I don't like it at all. No, no, it, doesn't, no. it doesn't work, you know, it's, imagine what somebody better than I, you know, could, could be doing with this right now. But that doesn't matter because I'm not, this isn't the final version. This is only for me to get something. Um, you know, maybe adding like some walkway stones creates the illusion of maybe a path. And I'm just drawing as I'm thinking, you know, like maybe for some reason this is, you know, this house is situated on like a little more of like a raised thing, which adds to the intensity of her walking up towards this thing. Um, so. so heightening emotion a little bit. Depends on like how much of the clearing she's coming through. You put some stuff in the foreground there. Um, you know, again, it depends on like what the style of the show is. Um, you know, things, you know, I mean, subtly, this cloud is pointing us toward the house. This is pointing us up toward the house. Um, you know, all of this stuff is sort of converging our eye over to this area. I may even cut in closer, you know, in, in Storyboard Pro, which we often use, you can just change the, change the composition, you know, so maybe that is stronger. But nonetheless, I want to get this 
type of an idea across as to like, you know, I think by putting a little, you know, putting a little bit of a, uh, giving us this kind of like an elevated house, you know, up a little, still in the woods, but up a little creates one way in, one way out, as opposed to running, you know, through the back door or something, you know, it's like we've created a sense of danger, maybe some trees down here, that if we're seeing the tops of, you know, evergreen trees down here really helps illustrate the, the cavernous, uh, you know, down below kind of a thing. Again, this is super rough and I still don't like it, but it at least gives me something. It at least gives me somewhere to go, you know, and, and the shot maybe following this is, you know, maybe there's some, you know, brush and stuff like this, you know, and maybe it's, Maybe it's a little red riding hood here, you know, and there's maybe a little shadow on her, but maybe she's peeking, you know, in through the, again, this is super, super rough, but, you know, maybe something like that where she's peeking out, you know, and she's in shadow a little bit and, you know, you see that sort of worry, uh, you know, that sort of uh, trepidation as she, she gets closer, you know. Um, but depending on what part of the story it is, maybe, Instead of that, she just joyfully bounds up those steps uh, to get to the door because she doesn't know that something bad waits inside. In which case, depending on the lighting or depending on sort of what uh, you know, what you do with that, could make it uh, could also work to serve that purpose. You know, you could also add. Let's just switch to could all you know if that's the case again. Depending on what it is, you know, you could also add. Uh, maybe the wolf has placed. Uh, like this way or something like that, um, you know, like almost there. Being very Chuck Jones. <laughs> you know, and it's like Rewarded. right here. And then like a giant sign with like lights, like <laughs> one night home, you know, and this thing is like flashing and glowing like that. And all of a sudden, like you just turn this into like a, you know, like a Vegas, you know, type thing, you know, these arrows pointing the way, you know, kind of a thing. Maybe you add in like those like velvet ropes, you know, and it's like, man, like the royal treatment is just set out for, you know, it's like, it's just unfortunate that's going to end in her demise, you know, but it's like, it depends on what, what element that, that comes into play. You know, if this was a, uh, you know, like a Miyazaki film, then I don't know if that would exactly be the way I would approach it, but um, personally, my approach, you know, in, in my take on it, you know, maybe it involves something like that, you know. <laughs> so now, I know you've got some examples of storyboard, uh, how boarding and using those as almost a flip approach. Let's take a look at those. Oh, sure. Well, I found these, uh, I found these yesterday, and I feel bad that I don't know the, the exact artist of them. Um, but old, you know, uh, storyboards of Tigger, you know, and these boards are so alive, you know, they're so alive. We take for granted now that, um, you know, boarding now is done, you know, often digitally and you have, you know, as many panels as your heart can desire and things like that. These are all born, boarded on paper, you know, and, you know, they were pinned up on boards one at a time. And so, you know, you can feel the, uh, you know, these read left to right, top to bottom. Um, you can feel the energy in these. You know, you, we don't need, you know, maybe now if I were to board this happening, you would take a couple panels, have Tigger come and Rue come in, then land, then jump, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just these didn't have the, these boards and this time period didn't have the luxury of that. And so each one of these panels had to, completely convey the idea you know you couldn't afford not to know what Tigger was thinking he looks up he looks down he's still smiling when he looks down and then reacts and then we cut to what he's reacting to um you know when we see all of these little you know tick marks and had you know action lines and all this stuff it just makes these uh it just makes these boards come so alive and it's so wonderful to look at and study because you know that, you know, if they can do this with fewer panels, think of what you can do with more panels and boarding digitally now, you know. Um, I love these panels from, uh, 
from Tigger's song. You know, they're so alive. Also, going back to bad drawings, you know, I'm not calling any of these bad, but this does not look like the Tigger that we know, you know, and it doesn't have to because these boards are all in boxes in the research library and the film is on Disney Plus, you know, like, so this doesn't have to look exactly like Tigger. You know, that's a different one than this, than that, you know, maybe they look different, but no one's looking at the character model here. We're looking at sequentially, how does this song play out? Tigger bounces up and down, he flips on his head because the lyrics refer to, you know, the, the top, um, the bottom, you know, and spring. So we do the tail with, you know, and he bounces around. Um, all, there's so much here that is not, uh, focusing on the actual draftsmanship of the characters. You know, it's like Winnie the Pooh's technically a little different here than he is there, but that's not what we're looking at, you know? And I think one of the, the things that's worth looking at with these, uh, with these boards is, you know, here's two panels from that. There's the panel when he's up and the panel when he's down. And when you flip through these, that tiger is doing nothing but bouncing. All you did was flipped, you know, uh, inverted, you know, his, the arch of his spine, and now it arches the opposite way. You know, the tail is down, now the tail is up. You know, the, the head is sort of leaning down that, that, you know, line of action of him sort of down like that. Line of action has changed that way. And it all works, it all works so well, you know? And, uh, and that's just two panels. That's just two panels that you could just recycle over and over in an animatic until Tigger needs to stop bouncing, you know? And it just, it works so well. And there's so much to, uh, you know, to learn from the, that. It's a great example of the visual, uh, sort of unexpected or the opposite, the, you know, the- Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, things like this, things like making a character, uh, making a character jump like that. Um, you know, if you have a, if you have a flag, you know, the, it, there's just, so, that's, things that people get away with when in reality it's just cheating it's, you know it's like you have this you know if you, if you have a scene where there's a flag that needs to be waving or something in the distance and all you do is you know flip that flip that around you know uh you know and then you know when you flip it back and forth it looks like the flag's waving in the breeze kind of a thing you know you do that all the time just to help make things uh you know come alive and make them uh make them, you know, make the action read, because that's what we're doing. We're selling that action of the story, that moment of the story. So let's let's take this back and apply it to our little Red Riding Hood scenario. <laughs> He's about to meet that big bad wolf. But in this instance, uh, Little Red turns the tables, and she uh, puts the wolf in his place, maybe. Um, so if we're doing, if we're relying on comedy here to, you know, we're trying to, using the unexpected to, to lead our comedy, to lead our humor, how would you envision that? How would you uh, bring, bring that to life? Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of what my approach with, with boarding is, is it has a, so much to do with the thought process and the thinking of what you're doing. Um, you know, like I said, you give somebody a script and they need to, uh, they need to storyboard that, then they, they will do that. Um, it's not hard to learn how to draw a character from a model sheet that the studio provides you or a turnaround or things like that. Um, but what isn't easy is to tap into who this character is. You know, when you see, when you start to see things come, you know, come alive, you, it's pretty easy for you to say, well, you know, this character wouldn't act like this. Well, it's just a cartoon. It's just a drawing, you know, like who's to say which way they act or not. The reason why people feel that way, um, you know, especially with, with, you know, reboots, if they aren't satisfied with the way characters were handled or brought back, it's because we've come to know these characters as real personalities and, and as real people, you know, we're familiar with them. So, um, Let's, you know, let's it, apply that to, let's give, give a little bit of personality to Little Red. Well, the thing is, is like, and again, these are going to start out as really bad drawings, but, you know, Little Red Riding Hood is, is exactly what we know it as, but your example was that Little Red uh, is going to give, you know, the, the wolf's going to meet more than he was expecting. Is that right? Kind of yeah. what you're, 
she's it's no. unexpected who you know so we might she might have a very innocent look now if we look back to uh the little little red riding hood out of uh the 40s um we have a very different look to her she's very uh, curvy and shapey and uh vivacious voluptuous uh so we would anticipate um, her using her feminine wiles. But in this instance, if we're playing with unexpected characterizations, um, we'd want to make her perhaps, a, a you know, if, if the end result is going to be totally unexpected, we'd perhaps want to play into that with her look, right? I mean, maybe if I were boarding this, you know, and if this was just a little scene, and I tell folks this all the time, you know, if you're going to board something for your portfolio, um, think of it like telling a joke. You know, if you're going to occupy my time for me to tell you, a, you know, to tell me a joke, I want the payoff to be, to be worth it, you know, especially if it's recruiters looking at, uh, you know, or hearing a ton of jokes all day long kind of a thing, you know, what's going to make your portfolio stand out? Um, maybe everything leading up until this scene uh, we, we only saw silhouettes or we only saw, uh, you know, the red cape go through the, the woods, mm -hmm. but because we're all aware of this story, um, you can play, we all know what's going to happen. We all know what's going to happen when, uh, when little red, uh, gets there. Well, maybe this little red... It's huge with this like tiny little red, tiny little red cape. And then this wolf is just, you know, sort of cowering down here, like, you know, things like that. You know, addition, I mean, I, an analogy that I've given many of times is, um, you know, you've got, you know, your, your, your standard, uh, you know, you got your standard three little pigs, you know, with, Every book that we've ever read with the wolf, you know, pig one, pig two, and pig three. You know, I tell people all the time, what if your wolf was, you know, this tiny little wolf cub who had every intention of eating these pigs, but these pigs were just, you know, these... You know, these just giant, like three giant pigs were like, they literally like build the house around them. You know, you've just created and allowed yourself to create, uh, you know, such a different take on that story. You know, it's like, it, you know, it's like why people call, you know, other people junior, you know, it's like, well, what if all these little pigs were only called little, you know, for that same reason. And all of a sudden this wolf has more cut out for him than he ever anticipated. Um, but what an opportunity for, for comedy here, you know, to, to now have the three little pigs told from this little wolf's perspective, as opposed to what we've always known, which is, well, why couldn't that wolf outsmart that, you know, um, he's so much bigger than that, you know, you, you flip that around and all of a sudden, uh, you know, you've opened brand new doors in regards to comedy, um, in regards to a fresh perspective, you know, for the piece in your portfolio or things that, um, allows you to look at it, you know, a little bit differently. You know, it's a great example of, again, the un utilizing the unexpected or the twist on what is known. You know, Tex Avery does that, uh, by but it inverts that even still by placing these classic characters in little, you know, Absolutely. Like Riding Hood by making them, you know, red hot Riding yeah. Hood, but also the wolf is actually, you know, a caricature of what we're seeing, what we've seen in, in the world at that point. Well, and, and that the reason why it works so well, you know, and, and I've sort of brought that into the world of boarding because the VizDev world does it all the time, you know, for VizDev portfolios and, you know, they'll take, they'll take a story like, you know, Roald Dahl's Matilda or, you know, a fairy tale or something, they'll set it in a different time and place, um, you know, they'll change genders, they'll change all, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, uh, I'll switch over here. And, uh, and they do that all the time um, because it allows you, you know, to explore different uh, textiles, different settings, different, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, cultures and things like that. And what is your take on it? Because at the end of the day, it's how, like I said, it's how you visually interpret the material. Um, and for me, I said, well, let's do the same thing with story. You know, so I encourage people to do that all the time. I see portfolios all the time of, um, you know, big elaborate concepts of going to, you know, different worlds and you've got this, you know, character that, and there's nothing to connect with because you're, you know, you're asking me to consume all of that at once when what I really want to tell you is that close up's a little too close. And I can't get there because there's so much for me to get in the way of, you know? And so I tell students that like, hey, if you reimagine Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Three Little Pigs, or you take a simple premise, doesn't even have to be like a, a nursery rhyme or something, take, take just a simple situation, um, give me something that is a pill small enough to swallow so that I can then look at your boarding work, you know, and the way that you interpret things like that. Um, and from that example, I've said that plenty of times. There was one year at the CTN Expo where I, this guy showed me his board and he, without, I'd never met him before. So he had no, had none of this as a reference. He showed me a sequence where he boarded Little Red Riding Hood, but the wolf, it opened with the wolf, not with Little Red. And it was a little, like little wolf cub. And he had a, a, a scout badge across his, you know, and he had all these badges. And uh, the one he was missing was uh, help a stranger. And he looks off into the distance and he sees this little girl with a little red cape, you know, through the hills. And he's like, hey, look, a stranger. I wonder if she needs help. And he runs off, right? And so he boarded this entire thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been telling people, you know, like such a great approach. The things that were, that could be improved from that board were all technical. They were all I know you put lines in the sky to show, you know, and on the ground to show grids and things like that, but it's not really working in regards to the perspective. I may go in close. It was all stuff that was more or less cosmetic that you could fix and teach and help, you know, things like that. And that was the first time I had seen a portfolio or I'd worked with somebody who got the essence of what we do and just need, you know, everybody's drawings improve over time. You get better every year, you know, your draftsmanship improves. Um, that was the first time I saw somebody's work where I was like, wow, you, you put all the thought process out here and all we got to do is tighten up other things like that. I was like that right there. That's the, the board artist approach, you know, whether it's a perfect model drawing of Tigger, like, you know, like what we, we looked at or not, what matters is the energy that we all know Tigger has. That all has to come through. If it doesn't, you know, then Tigger's personality wouldn't, wouldn't be as strong and, or, or presented as, you know, what we all identify with him as. Right. Um, Matt, if we've got any questions, let's weave a couple of questions in and we've got other things we're, we can move on to, but I wanna make sure that we get uh, our attendees. Do we have do we have any questions coming through? Hi, Mindy. Sorry. Ah, um, Tina. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, reiterate a question to ask Jordan: How much time does he spend on research and try and trying to come up with the best ideas? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's all about the research and the, the planning of things. Um, let me see where that folder is. I mean, that's what's so great about being here and not, and not doing this in person is that I have all this stuff in front of me. You know, when I, uh, when I worked on Tom and Jerry, those are, uh, those are, uh, board driven like i said those are board driven things and so um you know if we want to matt if you want to cut over to my desk um 18 pages of uh can you just see this camera how's that can you see that yep um you know i mean this yeah. th these are 18 pages of thumbnails you know for, of tom and jerry you know and these are just sharpie scribbles you know you can see i mean barely drawings at all but it's all the planning it's 13 pages worth of planning 
Um, and so it, especially with something uh, board driven like that, you really have to map it out. You have to build out everything that you, you know, you anticipate seeing, you know, it's, you know, animators do pose tests and um, it's all layers. You know, you can't just jump, uh, you can't just jump right in, you know, you have to sort of, you have to get through all the horrible drawings, you know, like I said, like my Sharpie roughs, you know, really scribbly pencil things. Um, and it's the same way, uh, it's the same way when I do uh, character design, you know, it, it's all really just rough drawings and, and stuff that you just have to get out to know, okay, well, you know what, I, I was wrong, that's not, maybe we don't go that direction, you know, things like that. Um, and you just gotta, you know, connect the two. How frequently do you um, you sketch these out, you sketch the idea out, and then do you need to step away uh, at times to kind of let it simmer and think, no, you know, it's not quite the right direction. Or, oh, I could push this further. Um, how frequently is that happening for you? Um, I mean, yeah, there, it's kind of a, a give take. If I'm like thumbnailing something out, like some of those Tom and Jerry things, um, a lot of times I, you know, if it's a car chase or something where you're like, hey, look, this is, this is what you're gonna earn your paycheck with this. You know, there's a lot here and you know, you have to keep tabs on things. And uh, then it can maybe get very scribbly and it's like, look, just figure out what's going where and how is this gonna work? Is it gonna pan? Are you gonna cut to a different shot? Things like that. And that's what those thumbnails are for. And let me just, get some sort of representation of uh, what I'm thinking about. And then when I scan all my little scribbles in and then move it to Storyboard Pro and actually start roughing out the episode, we'll address those then. But if I sit here and spend two, three hours trying to chart this giant thing, I'll never get to the next spot, you know? So you really just have to put something down that allows you, you know, it's like, it's not all gonna be solid foundations you know especially i mean tom and jerry don't talk so that was different but loud house you know um if there were dialogue scenes you're not really hung up on those because that's performance so you can really get through all that kind of stuff and then maybe more of the like connected tissue um you know you look at other things like that and uh and all the while knowing that it still all has to get down to whatever the time length is so it could be cut and reboarded and pasted back together, you know? So you have to really be flexible with knowing that, uh, that nothing necessarily stays unless it's strict plot elements, you know, those will, those will have to stay. So but, uh, in the course of all of that structure and, <laughs> and parameters that you have to work in, um, it, it's still the essence of it is about finding the heart of, of pulling the most funny out of that. So yeah. what, uh, where do you start? How does that play into that? Where, where is that set on the priority list when you sit down? <laughs> um, well, it's kind of, it's your, it's your interpretation, you know, if you will, of um, just like mentally how, how do you visualize this? How do I see this? You know, um, for me, I, um, I remember I had an episode uh, and it was brilliantly written and, and crafted and, you know, it stemmed from the core of the Loud House, which was, you know, 11 kids, a house full of 11 kids. Um, and it was awesome because it, it started with the main character, Lincoln. He had a friend over and one of his sisters wanted to watch her TV show. And, you know, she, I think she, she gave a little, well, I'm older, blah, blah, blah. And so she complained to her you know, off screen to the mom. And the mom said, well, well, Lincoln has a friend over, so he, he gets the remote. And then this just trickled down for the entire household where it was like, oh, well, in the next scene, that sister brought two friends over, you know? So now there were two of them, so she got the remote, you know? And it was so perfect. It was a perfect little concept. You know, it was a 11 minute cartoon. These are not 44 minute things where they have to hang on B plots and all this stuff. Um, and I'm reading this and I was like, wow, this is great. You know, like, I love this idea. I remember growing up, I only had two brothers, but 
yeah, there was always a little special treatment for whoever had a friend over to be polite and hospitable and things like that. Um, this is sort of the cartoon version of that where things sort of get out of hand. And I'm reading this, oh, this is great, this is fantastic. And then I turned as this plot starts to really escalate and peak. And it said, um, you know, now 11 kids. So the other sibling brings over four friends and then five friends. Um, and I turned the page and it was like, uh, you know, this other sibling came in and she brought, you know, she says that she has eight friends, but the script said we cut outside and we just hear this. And then we hear like the TV change and then we hear a sibling say, well, I have nine friends. And it was all done from different angles. We saw a close up of the living room window, but from outside the house, we just see this, we just hear it. Then we cut wider here and we see, and I said, man, how deflating that we don't get, you know, cause some of those kids in that higher bracket were Lucy, who was the little Wednesday Adam spooky one who brought eight of her contemporaries over who would have to also be spooky little kids. And then uh, the musical sister who brought all of her rock and roll friends over. And then one who, uh, the jokester sister who brought her entire clown club over. And I went to the director and I said, I know what the writers did. The writers tried to make this cheaper. I said, but it's only for, to illustrate how this is getting out of hand. We don't see them running around the house and things like that. I said, can I... Can I still keep them all? Can we still see all of them? But we won't, I won't move, like they won't be animated. They'll just be there. So all you have to do is put that visual on the screen. You don't have to animate it. So it's arguably kind of the same as just showing the outside of the house. And fortunately the director said yes, because I said, it'll, I want to see all of the spooky little kids, friends and all that. And they kept it and it worked really, really well because at the end of the day, it was visual. You know, it was visual to see this. And the whole point of your episode is when you bring more friends over, you get more privileges. And that never, you know, lands more than when the rock and roll sister has, I think it was like 11 of her rock and roll friends on the couch. And then the prankster sister brings 12 of her friends all dressed as clowns in. And there's 23, 24 kids on the screen. It's insane. It's absolutely madness. And I said, but that's what the show is. The show is about a little boy with 10 sisters. The whole show is about chaos. Let, you know, and this episode is about chaos, you know, keep inflating it, keep, you know, it, because as soon as you, you know, you can certainly fit all those people into a shot in live action. You know, it's like, so at the very least we should see all of these kids, you know, characters in there, you know? So that was one of my favorite examples that allowed us and to do that to the essence of comedy pushing the boundaries yeah it's way more funny to see all the you know because it the, it's it's ridiculous you know and and things that are ridiculous often coincide with them being comedic <laughs> to dwell in the ridiculous and get right for it too. <laughs> yes <Where> is that? <laughs> tina do we have any other questions i i think there was something about looking for some tips that cassie was asking Question from Ty Mingersoll also, any books you recommend and when considering funny props, et cetera, to add the humor, how do you come up with those funny ideas? Yeah, um, well, we can do the book. Matt, if you want to cut to the book slide that we have here. We should have some examples of these are things that you we have. Those, and then I have a couple here also that we can cut back to the uh, to my desk, but I can share some of these. There they're the books. So um, the Pixar Funny Book, which is also on the shelf behind Mindy, um, is fantastic. I have that one here as well in front of me. Um, you know, the book that really should be required reading for uh, for board artists. You know, it's it's full of you know the little gag with the mice from Ratatouille there to the right um, is from that book, and the book is just full of those types of drawings. You know, of of creative ways of uh just conveying a gag or a joke you know and it's just full of that those kinds of uh of drawings you know and they're loose you know you can see look none of those mice really look identical as they do in the other panel but nobody cares nobody cares you know because if you want to do that just copy and paste it and as soon as you copy and paste it it gets super flat and boring and there's no energy so don't do that just 
draw it and convey that. You know, um, directing the story in the bottom left, um, that image of the sort of yellowish purple drawings uh, below it, um, those are from that book. Um, that whole book is full of just ske little marker sketches like that. Um, and it is the greatest resource just to flip through um, because it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with Tigger, where it's like, look, if you can do it with a marker, at, like a, a Sharpie and one gray toned pen to show shadow, to, sh you know, to emphasize some things, then you can do it with Storyboard Pro and color options and all that other kind of stuff, you know? So that's just a great book to have just to flip through to, again, see the energy in drawing. Um, both the funny book and the, the directing the story book, they also have you know, you can see little things in that that cheese drawing up there. Uh, you know, those little action lines, little arrows to indicate things, use of color, you know, that cheese, the gag wouldn't read as well if the treat cheese wasn't yellow, you know? So just things that you learn by observing, you know? Uh, I think that's really important that, um, yes, I can physically tell you something and teach you something, but the things you'll learn from observing and from being like in the middle of it, you know, it's like we, you could either sit in a room and see PowerPoints and read books all about the art of swimming, or you could get thrown into water and say, you know what, it's either sink or swim. You know, that's where that analogy comes from, you know? And so it's like neither one outweighs the other, but they're two totally different ways of approaching it. And a lot of times just looking at books um, like that. Setting the Scene is a gorgeous book that few people really talk about. Kind of just, I think, fell off the radar. But um, it's all layout from, uh, from animation. You know, a ton of stuff from Disney and things like that. And, um, you know, now these are more layout drawings. This isn't boarding specifically. But it piggybacks off of everything we talked about with, um, you know, set design and theater design. Because it's showing you, um, you know, you can kind of see in that, that screenshot below. Um, it's showing you why, you know, I mean, think of the scene where Peter Pan and the kids fly through the sky to Neverland. You know, if there were a bunch of power cables and trees and all that stuff in the layout, it would take away from focusing on them, you know? So you really have to design, same way that, I mean, you can kind of see it there. When all the kids in silhouette land on the hand of the clock, it's iconic because you have these great little silhouettes leaning, they're illuminated from behind, they're backlit from the clock, and it just makes for a really good visual, just a strong composition, Peter Pan silhouetted against the moon, you know, so such an incredible book to flip through and just, again, learn by um, obser observing. Those are some art books. Um, and I think I have a couple more listed that, um, that'll be passed on to everybody. On the right side of this is something that I just, I just don't feel like people, they only talk about art books, you know, if, if somebody says, I want to be a painter, can you recommend any books? More often than not, every book they'll recommend to you is about painting and brush strokes and color and things like that. Will anybody give you a psychology book? Probably not, but why not? Because mood and tone and feeling and all that kind of stuff. So in the same tone, I, you know, recommend other books. You know, um, Jaws is one of my favorite movies. That coffee table book there is about three inches thick and it, tells more about everything that went wrong while making that movie than it does praise the movie. The movie doesn't need any praise. Everybody loves that movie. It's iconic. It's it, uh, beyond, you know, classic is an understatement. But why don't you sit down and read about all the things that went wrong in order to get it to the place that it is, you know, because if we only talk about how successful artists are or how, you know, every time I put pen to paper, it's a goal, perfect drawing. It's like, well, that's, not the case, you know, and we need to erase that narrative because otherwise people will sit down and try to do a drawing. And if it's not great, they'll second guess themselves. And that's not the case. Um, likewise, Matt, if you want to switch to the desk, I can show you some examples of that imagination book. Um, this Henson book is like easily one of the, uh, one of the greatest books um, around. And it's basically all of Jim Henson's uh, like pencil sketches uh, and color pencil sketches of, you know, like there's his, whoops, there's his drawing of uh, Dr. Teeth, um, you know, and these really, really rough and crude uh, drawings, you know, there's one of Sweetums up there, um, these super crude drawings on like yellow lined paper, um, but, 
you know, I would, there's some big bird drawings. It's like, you know exactly what he's doing. You know, the, you know, there's a little Oscar crouch. It's like, they're not perfect. Nothing about these drawings are perfect, but what they do, here's this Rolf drawings. It's like, they, they started the conversation. They put something down on paper, you know, of what he's, uh, what he's envisioning. You know, you can do a, a ton of Google searches for, um, uh, Steven Spielberg's storyboards. Steven Spielberg does storyboards for his films. It's another little gag. Um, a lot of times Steven Spielberg will, uh, he'll do really rough storyboards for his, uh, editor. And he says, this is what I want. He said, I want to go wide. I want to do this. I want to cut close. Um, and I've seen interviews where his editors say, you know, it, they are like ballpoint pen on, you know, uh, legal pads. And you look at them and these belong in the trash, you know, for, for with all due respect. But he said, when you look at them sequentially and you see what he wants to do, he said, and then I see that. And then I get the footage that he shot and I cut it together based on the really, really rough and crude drawings. He said, it works every time. It works every time you see it, you cut to the really close up of Harrison Ford, you, you know, and he's like, and it, he's like, so what, why do the drawings have to be better if they are that effective? And it's, that's so powerful to me, you know? So, um, Matt, there were a couple of other books on there. Uh, the, you're lucky, you're funny book, um, uh, written by Phil Rosenthal, who co-created, uh, everybody loves Raymond, an incredible book about, uh, the writer's room of that show writers coming in, sharing experiences from their own home lives um, to see if there's stories there. Some stories about uh, writers getting in trouble with their wives for picking arguments just to see how they would react um, and then catching on because they saw it done in an Everybody Loves Raymond episode. And that, you know, it's just brilliant things um, that, I mean, that book has nothing to do with animation, but it has everything to do with storytelling. It has everything to do with crafting is everything to do with putting something together. And just because I do it with a pen and not actors on a set over at CBS doesn't make anything, you know, doesn't make a difference there. Um, Steal Like an Artist, great little book. A lot of times it'll be on Amazon for on sale for like $4. When it is, I usually buy two or three copies to give away when I talk to schools or, uh, you know, give away to, to students that I'm mentoring that are really latching on to some of the stuff I talk about. Great little resource there. Um, that Martin Short book, I'm a big fan of him. Um, it's one of his memoirs and, uh, his wife passed away, uh, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. Um, and he goes into depth about what that was like, you know, um, the thing that I think is so fascinating about him and that story is, you know, you had folks like Robin Williams who had an in unbelievable career, you know, and the films that Robin Williams was in, you know, would, you could, you know, cover a room and posters of those movies. Martin Short's career isn't exactly as visual in regards to the projects that he's been a part of. You know, we all are familiar with him, but he hasn't been in two movies a year kind of a thing. What he is, is a personality. He's a great personality. You know what you're going to get from him. He never shined brighter than he did when he was a guest star on Letterman. Um, and that's what's fascinating about that book is he loses his wife. And as soon as he steps out of a car or onto a stage, he's expected to be exactly how he's portrayed on that cover. What is that like to have to go through one of the most difficult things anybody has to go through and yet still from the public's persona be expected to perform and deliver, you know? Again, that goes sort of back to psychology and sort of analysis and, you know, artists all the time are struggling with, you know, uh, you know, there have been plenty of dark days in, the world when I was asked to go to work and draw kids that are having a water balloon fight or, you know, uh, you know, baking a cake or, you know, just gags and things like that, where it just doesn't feel right, but you sort of have to figure out the middle ground there, you know? So, um, these are just a sampling of books, but, um, you know, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, looking beyond just the, uh, the books that are labeled art and animation on, uh, um, on Amazon, you know, uh, Bob Iger's book about running the company, you know, going from a meeting of talking about, uh, you know, the new film and then going over to Glendale and he's looking at stuff that has to be approved to go into Shanghai Disneyland. It's like, you know, 
talk about management, you know, and things like that. So there's a, a ton of resources, you know, and as soon as you allow yourself to see things beyond just a book about the making of Jaws, but how do you, how do you complete a project successfully when everything is pitted against you? As soon as you look at it through a different lens like that, you'll really start to see the value in, in, in a lot of these stories. So um, often that's, these are some of the references I have. And those are things that sort of definitely tie into what we've been talking about in terms of that balance between tragedy and comedy. Yeah. Uh, human qualities that we experience yep. and finding ways to find something, find the humor in the darkest times or against yep. the darkest times, absolutely. Yeah. I think these are a great, uh, it's a great point to also reiterate that it goes far beyond uh, pencil to paper. It's who you are as a person and your experiences, your psychology, your observations that you bring to what it is that you're putting on. Paper. Observation is huge. And like I said, it's, it's what you, it's why we go to restaurants because there's so many things that we can't make at home. And are just so much better somewhere else. You know, it's why we engage with other people. And, uh, and that is so important with all of this because you borrow, you learn things from that. You know, um, my, I have two brothers, my middle brother, very quiet, very, uh, more reserved, you know, uh, than I am myself. Um, he just got his master's degree. He does a lot of cognitive, uh, brain study work in Pittsburgh. Um, which is eons away from what I do. Um, and he is without a doubt, one of the funniest people I've ever met because he, when he sees an in, in a conversation or when we're all together as a family or things like that, or he references something, you know, someone we know or things like that, he strikes and it hits so, and it lands so much harder and funnier because you're not necessarily expected to get it from him more so than you maybe would from me and things like that. And I, you know, I've told people plenty, you know, like some of my groomsmen in my wedding, I said, when you, when, you know, when we're around, when we're all together for the wedding and thing, I was like, he, you will cry laughing, you know, because he just has a different way of, you know, interpreting things and then sharing his feelings on it. And it's funny every time to me you know, because it's different, you know, and if you only sit around, you know, and talk with people who, you know, we talk over each other and things like that, that's great, because you guys get along for those reasons. But, you know, open conversations with folks that have, you know, different stories and different, you know, things to share and, you know, different, you know, things that, I mean, you know, people that, you know, are older than you that have different experiences that I, I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to meet any of the nine old men. It just didn't work out chronologically for me. So I rely on stories from you, Min, you know, and things like that. And, and that's all I can do, but I'm grateful for it, you know? And so it's like, you need to take advantage of those opportunities to, to learn other personalities, other cultures, other things, what's universally funny, you know, uh, visually. I mean, I'm, you know, you walk into, I would walk into Nickelodeon in the morning and there would be these giant TVs all the way at the other end of the lobby. And they'd have my storyboards next to the final animation play. Can't hear it, but you can't help but look because the screen is huge and you can see these expressions, you can see these poses. And I, you're like, okay, that's very important. You know, no disrespect to the writers or the voice actors, but hey, if it doesn't work with the sound off, you know, why is it going to work with the sound on? You know, it's like, of all storytelling. <laughs> you know, so it's very important. You know, I remember when our show first premiered we had a lot of feedback from parents that were saying, you know, when I look in on the kids watching the show, you know, I've caught glimpses of it and I've really loved what I've seen. I was like, well, you certainly didn't comprehend the story or learn any of that kind of stuff. So whatever you saw visually sold you on it. And that could not be more important for the way that we convey gags, the way we, you know, like with that little Red Riding Hood example, the way you present the material, you know, is it foreboding? Is it inviting? Things like that. And, um, you know, if it plays without, you know, I just saw, um, I just saw a clip of, uh, of an animatic of something I worked on and it's, there's no dialogue and it works, you know, it works, the timing of it works, you know, and 
it's all very, very important. You know, don't don't allow there to be crutches. No more. And particularly in our this medium, we are physic We are shown a story. We aren't necessarily told a story, and yeah. that's where the you know visual impact is is really what what is drawing you in first and foremost, and right. something very key to to keep in mind. Yeah, um, yeah I think. Do we have a few more uh, questions for Jordan? Yes, <clears throat> yes, we do. Uh, from Darren Michaels, when boarding, you have to be thinking about camera shots and cutaways, et cetera. Do you take a class or do you recommend taking classes in filmography or something to learn that visual storytelling technique? Yeah, I, uh, I lead a, I have a storyboard workshop that I've written uh, and done with CTN. Um, and the first slide of that is this very populated slide of uh, examples of close-ups wide shots, extreme close-ups, uh, panning, tilting, you know, on all this kind of stuff. And it's all in one slide. And I usually start that workshop by saying, all right, look at this for a couple of minutes and then we're going to move on. Because how many times do you have to be told what a close-up is, you know? And that's kind of my approach where, you know, it is very, very much, you know, cinematography and, uh, and things like that. You know, I remember seeing that, that, uh, Seth MacFarlane movie, uh, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Not a good movie. Not, not even really, not even really a funny movie. Um, but I remember watching it and I was like, this is one of the most gorgeous films I've ever seen. It's a Western and it, it has so many wide shots and just cinemascope-esque feelings with these gorgeous mountains and landscapes. And I was like, you know, if you could just give me a coffee table book of these gorgeous, 16 by 9 compositions and these beauty shots I would like that way more than I like your movie you know and so cinematography and and you know, you know filmography all that stuff is very important a lot of times we'll do film studies you know you'll watch a movie when they when the camera cuts you know draw a new composition and um and you're it's impossible not to learn from the reason why they're doing things like that and um I love uh shots let me see if we can do this here but I love, uh, I love like movies where, you know, something will be happening, but like the entire camera is like obscured by a shadow and there's someone in the back, you know, and it's like, look what they're doing with those compositions. Not everything has to be, you know, they're not showing you things for a reason, you know, and, um, study, this is a good point to make a study of, of like exactly that Hitchcock's work. And, oh, yeah. and watch it even without the sound and just watch visually what he's doing. You could take any of his films, uh, Spielberg's films. He beautifully works with uh, the composition of his frames and pushes to give you a sense of story and narrative. I know that uh, Spielberg, and Jaws and, the, and films that you spoke about earlier, but watch a Scorsese film. Watch how he's, watch it with the sound off and look at the visuals. That gives you a solid... There's there's planning, you know, Hitchcock yes. was one of the first people to uh, take storyboards into live action based on what he saw Walt Disney was doing. And Hitchcock, and rightfully so, had pretty much complete control and carte blanche over everything he did. And when he saw that Snow White was completed in its entirety in storyboards and subsequently as, as a story reel, you know, Hitchcock couldn't to look away from that that was a huge added layer in addition to all the control he already had he had so much more control where he could approve storyboards and he may not even have to be on set every single day he's you know and he was very much told he didn't like to be on set actually right exactly I mean, especially bob outside storyboards bob boyle who was a professor of mine at afi worked extensively with extensively with hitchcock on north by northwest and Marnie and the birds. And when you look at Bob's storyboard sequences for those great iconic moments in cinema that we attribute to Hitchcock, it's really Bob's vision on the sequence and timing and the cutting. And it becomes the shortcut. And you bring up a good point. I think few people realize that the storyboard process began at Disney Studios from the very, yeah. very beginning, going back to the early Mickey Minis, to be able to, we need some way to visually convey kind of a visual script, and thus began the idea of storyboarding, and Hollywood took on, and 
Hitchcock is one of the great examples of, of a filmmaker taking that because we know when we think of Hitchcock, we think of those strong, in, impactful visuals of unexpected. That's what makes his brilliance. He works within suspense, but there's a bit of wit and humor about what he does at times as well. Playing with that unexpected, you know, seeing someone crawl across the face of Mount Rushmore or climbing down Statue of Liberty. Oops, spoiler alert. Uh, but those kinds of things are, are strong, it, examples to utilize and i know you've uh, talked in our conversations you've talked about how you'll make a study of those kinds of things mm -hmm. well it's important I, the storyboards created a financial safety net in a time where this medium especially our medium was first coming around um right. and subsequently just film live action films and budgets to begin with you know um it created something where you can look at the entire board and know what's there you know i just i pitched an episode the other day you know 600 700 panels and it was just me clicking through each one but you saw the action you saw everything that's going on there and everybody knows what this looks like you know and so when it's animated and the animation comes in and we call retakes you're not calling retakes and being like hey you know what this needs to be a close-up you know we already did that a couple weeks ago, you're calling retakes on how it's physically animated. And that's so, such an invaluable resource to the, uh, to filmmaking, animation, live action, things like that, you know? So um, if you can see it all play out, you know, um, you know. More so in live action, the use of animatics and, and pre-visualization through storyboarding. Um, it's such a crucial, critical part. It really is the crux of storytelling. Yeah. Um, Tina, what else do we have for uh, questions? I know there are a few coming through. The next question is from Cassie Soliday. Do you have any tips on how to keep the comedy rooted in the character? Great question. That's a fantastic question. Um, it comes with, you know, would a character do this? Would they not? You know, um, a lot of... Again, like I said, you know, when, when I was on The Loudest, we saw tons of tests that came in and Lincoln, the main character, is very easy to draw. He's arguably easier to draw than Mickey is. You know, he, all of his traits are within one circle head shape. It's not hard to draw at all. Um, but you need to do your research. You know, is this how a character would act and things like that. And um, I haven't been on a show where we haven't been given you know, brief character descriptions, uh, a little bit of a backstory, you know, pitch show Bibles are, are huge, you know, really important. Um, and, you know, you get information in regards to this is how they feel. They don't, you know, they, they don't like this, they like this, they're not super close with this sibling or they, you know, and things like that. And, and you, you know, uh, consume that. And then you, you know, it's all, it's, character analysis that's really what it is you know it's studying it's like you know think of any think of any film you know think i mean go back to jaws you know we all you know quint the the fisherman you know he it's very obvious there are things he would and would not do i i don't think he would ever drink coffee with cream in it you know um i don't know if he would drink coffee out of a cup with a handle on it. um you know i think the majority of his diet consists of seafood i don't think he's ever had a bagel or carbs or anything muffin that we would you know it's like but that's all you know if, if i had a scene with him like i said you know maybe a cup you know a paper cup of water or a cup of black coffee you know and a little judgment in expression or uh or you know with his uh performance of somebody who does rip open a Splenda packet and add that to their coffee. You know, what do you need that for? You know, it's like you would take shots at Richard Dreyfus's character. You know, you got city hands, you know, you've been counting money all your life, you know, and things like, and it's just, there's such rich, you know, really good characters have, you know, they know those, you know, as a character, uh, you know, Lincoln's best friend in the Loud House is more timid. He's an only child. Lincoln has 10 siblings. Clyde doesn't, you know, he's an only child. He's more reserved. He's more anxious. Um, the two of them play off each other really well, you know? Uh, and so it's, it's 
really analyzing those sorts of things, you know, and it's why I find it fascinating with, um, you know, reboots and stuff like that, you know, a couple, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think there's, in, you bring up a great point that opposites, you know, the pairing of opposites within the context of the story um, permits one thing that one character may not do characteristically, but the other can to yeah. sort of balance the composite of the, the mm -hmm. experience. And Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the Golden Girls. That's not a surprise to anybody who knows me. But one of the things that the writers talked about was that you could take, um, and all four women won the Emmy for their performances on that show. Um, and you could take a script from that show and you could remove the names and you could read the dialogue and still know which line went to which of those four characters. That's brilliant. That's a brilliant, those are brilliant characters. Those are brilliant archetypes. And all of that is working so well for the purpose, which is the show, which is the episode, the script, whatever. Um, because you know what they're going to say, you know? And if you know what they're going to say, you know who would react. If a character says something, and then they cut to another character, and you can already in your head, like, oh my gosh, imagine what they're going to say to that, you know, be Arthur to Betty White in that scenario. Um, you've just created real characters. You just created characters that only exist. It's all pretend. They're playing these characters. It's not real. But you've, you've created a world and a house and a kitchen table with these characters that the audience tunes into because they want to see them in these scenarios. They want to see how they'll interact with this, you know, like. Have you, and, have you I was gonna say, have you ever had an instance where a character has uh, been called upon to do something that might not seem within their logical uh, way, the character? Yeah, yeah and then, for what sure. Do you do with that, do you, do you push this? Do you question it? Do you, push the boundaries and, and find a way to get that conveyed? Well, it's interesting, you know, like the characters from The Loud House were so defined personalities and archetypes. Um, you know, I was like, I like the Spice Girls. There's the sporty one, the musical one, the scary one, you know, and it's like, they were all, you could define them all with one adjective. Um, and, uh, and I actually, the, the episode that I co-directed, I boarded it and then subsequently co-directed it, um, it was about the sibling, uh, the girl, who Luann, who is the practical jokester, and she's the comedian one. Um, and she, uh, the episode opens, she got uh, locked out. They picked electives at school, and she couldn't get into her comedy electives. And all she was left with was a cooking class. She didn't want to take a cooking class. And the dad, their, their dad, is a cook. He cooks at home. He has his own restaurant and things like that. And so it's a buddy episode between the two of them of him showing her, uh, you know, how, you know, the cook, how to cook and the similarities between those. Um, and I had thoughts where I said, you know, the, another one of the siblings is the sporty one and her name's Lynn and her name's Lynn Jr. Because the dad's name is Lynn. And I started thinking and I said, this episode might have worked better if Lynn wasn't able to take a gym or a physical sports activity and was forced to be stuck inside in the kitchen taking a cooking class because the similarities between or the the parallels between uh comedy and then cooking aren't maybe as strong or could maybe be as defined as the similarities between working together on a team multiple ingredients subsequently all trying to achieve the same thing winning the game and making the dish you know and and i kind of like rewrote a couple of paragraphs and i said no we could have done this episode with that other sibling you know and but that's when you really really look into those personalities like that you know so we did what we could with the with the other uh sibling but it's it's always interesting to sort of see those you know have those eyes open a little wider to be like hey you know this episode could have worked and maybe worked a little bit better with with for these reasons you know and and strictly from the defined personality and, and who these characters are you know if that makes sense love it 
Tina, any other questions? Yes, there's quite a few here for both of you. Uh, Kaylin is asking, have you seen the making of the Mandalorian special on Disney Plus? And if so, how do you feel about the blending of the live action and animated TV show process, specifically with using LA actors in scenes that have been boarded through previs in essentially animated backgrounds? Do you think this is the future of filmmaking? That is a magical question, and I feel bad to say that I haven't seen that or The Mandalorian because, contrary to many of my colleagues, I I've never been the world's biggest Star Wars fan. <laughs> but nonetheless, a phenomenal question. I'm just not the one that has the right answer for you. <laughs> well, I do think I think that this is where we're headed, and we're seeing, you know, particularly in our current not to date this, but our current COVID confinement, um, we're seeing that animation can is continuing just fine, thank you very much, having moved to a digital platform some time ago. Uh, Tina Price had a big hand in that uh, not too long ago. Um, we are grateful that she's here with us on this. But um, I think this is really where we're headed with storytelling, don't you, Jordan? I think oh, yeah. things are blending. It, I think it's standard for most um, live action. Uh, there are instances economically, you know, logistically, uh, professorially that you would want to bring in and have backgrounds or uh, some aspect of what you're seeing on screen produced through an animation process uh, and yes. or created through art. Um, and it just is, it's only going to push the worlds that we can be exploring and the stories we can be telling in a much more exciting way and um, yeah. cost effectively, imaginatively, absolutely. I mean, look at it from, from a storytelling standpoint, um, you know, the parameters of feature film mm -hmm. are pretty similar, you know, I mean, we have things now that are being released directly to streaming services or, or you know, video on demand um, due to the current situation. Um, but they're still feature films. They're still, you know, they still sort of hit the same notes, you know, and the, the main problem, you know, we have, you know, is introduced and then it's resolved. You know, it's like feature films, those, that's pretty consistent. That's pretty much remained the same. The world of what is loosely known as television you know, by comparison to feature films, the majority of, especially like live action television, um, ton of series that are 44 minutes, you know, it's that sweet spot of you're getting more than a half hour, but it's not a full hour. It's not, you know, maybe it's a full hour with commercials if it's on a network or something like that. But um, you have those areas opening up, you know, you have these uh, the new Looney Tunes shorts from Warner Brothers with uh, with HBO Max, you know, some that series was announced as 1,001 minutes of new Warner Brothers cartoons. It's complete departure from the standard order of 50 to 11 minute episodes make one season of network television. You know, 1,001 minutes means there may be a 45 second Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny short, and then there may be a six minute Porky and Daffy short. But what's so energizing about that is they're doing that in service of the story. We want to tell the story with, we want to tell the story with Elmer and Bugs. This would be super fun. What a great little bit, you know, but trying to get six minutes out of it would be like pulling teeth. So you know, imagine the stories that fall by the wayside because we can't get to 11 minutes. Maybe it's a great six minute uh, cartoon, but we can't get to 11, so we have to abandon it all completely. That's heartbreaking, you know? And so what we're seeing with a lot of, you know, the, the new, you know, avenues, streaming services, things like that is uh, just make it, you know, make it. Let, it, let the audience find it, you know? It's one of the things I'm a diehard Muppet fan and the Muppets have a new series coming to Disney Plus in July. Um, and it's a great place for it, you know, because, you know, there's debates as to whether the most recent Muppet movies from the last couple of years have, you know, were good, you know, or were the right this or blah, blah, blah. And it says, well, if they're going to Disney Plus with this new series, their, their audience will find them, you know. And 
I've, I've made the comparison of streaming services of walking into a library. I have no interest in reading every book in this library. I'm going to go to the section that interests me the most. And so if I'm a Muppet fan, I'm going to go find this series on Disney+. Plus. But if you put a Muppet film in the theaters, that way of thinking is saying, well, it's got to do, it's got to do well. Well, it, it may not draw the same kind of audience as the new Star Wars movie draws. Doesn't mean it's not good, but it unfortunately is being marked as not as successful, which prevents maybe another one from happening. You know, so my hopes with these streaming services and, and with this approach is, you know what, you got, you know, a series of, of, you know, the project I'm working on right now, they're six minute cartoons. And it's phenomenal. It's great because it's a six minute thing and then it's done. And then we do another one, you know, and, and it's great and it will exist and you can consume them. And, you know, and, and I just love that we're, we're doing more than, you know, the two boxes. Is it, is your show 11 minutes like SpongeBob and the Loud House or is it 22 that fits a full half hour? Check one or the other. It's like, well, what if I did three, seven minutes that fit in the half hour block? Well, I don't know. People haven't done that before. You're like, yeah, but it would still, you know, wouldn't it work three, seven minutes? That's still 21, 22 minutes, you know? And I love that that's being broken down, you know, and, and that we're getting things like a Mandalorian show that, you know, would that survive on cable or is it more successful on streaming, you know, and then that in turn, you know, prompts a making of series, you know, and it's like it, at the end of the day, it's an, a win for content creators and people who want to consume content, you know, and that's what we've always wanted. We've always wanted shows like the, personally, the Imagineering story, um, you know, or the prop culture thing where it's like, there it is. It's right there. You know, where would that prop culture show on Disney plus right now about all those, the, the films and all those props, where would that show live outside of a streaming service? Would it be on YouTube? It, it wouldn't, it would kind of maybe be ignored on YouTube. You know, I don't know if the Disney channel would take, time out maybe abc i wouldn't know but it's perfect for the outlet that it's on you know and i think that's what you know we're seeing it rapidly especially now you know i think that's where you know the the industry's headed with with you know these everything has a platform if it deserves to be seen you know and that's that's the argument the argument is do we like this should we make this not do we have room in our lineup for this is this something that maybe would work next year, but not this year. If we would have had this three years ago, it would have been perfect. I don't know if it's good, right? You're not talking about the show anymore. You're talking about the program. Whereas streaming services allow you to talk about the quality of the show and what you're making and, you know, kiss the rest of it goodbye. So I, that's very inspiring, you know, personally. It's a whole new frontier. Yeah. Uh, Dina, any uh, next questions? I think we're getting close to the end of our time here. If you want to take it away and yeah. close it up. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining and particularly Jordan for uh, letting us into your world for a, a thank minute you, Mindy. and getting us to uh, uh, get a little more insight into how we work to find the funny and what we do. And I hope that we can, uh, as we move forward with this, we hope to see everybody returning back. We've got a terrific lineup. Um, ahead. If you go to where you checked in, we're going to be uh, speaking with the Bancroft brothers next week, Tony and Tom. Uh, some exciting news just announced about Tony's latest film, Animal Crackers, finally getting distribution, and it's been getting rave, rave reviews, so finally it's going to be uh, set on a platform we can all access soon. Um, so definitely check these uh, things out. We've got Aliki Theobolopoulos coming, um, Leaky T, <laughs> a little easier to pronounce, Don Hahn, Bonnie Arnold, some terrific, terrific talent that, uh, and primary sources that you're going to be able to get access to, uh, exploring some great topics that will have some application. Um, so stay tuned for that. There are a lot of great events coming up through CTN, so keep coming back to ctntickets.com. A lot of terrific announcements happening uh, as we move through our new existence here online, which is exciting. You can find more information about me, who I am, and why I get to be in this amazing seat to be able to ask these incredible questions. I'm at mindyjohnsoncreative.com. You'll also find bios and other materials on me at CTN. 
And remember always that your best source is a primary source. And we are grateful for you, Jordan, to opening up your world and allowing us to, to take a peek inside and learn a bit more. So thanks everybody. I wanna thank the amazing wizards behind the scenes at CTN here to make this happen. Spread the word and we'll be back Tuesday at 11 o'clock. See you then.